And good morning, everyone. Happy Monday morning to you, and welcome back to Morning Musings. My name is Don K. Preston. I'm the president of Preterist Research Institute of Arden, Oklahoma. I'm just really, really thrilled that you are with me. Hope you had a fantastic weekend, by the way. Uh, we are enjoying some of the most beautiful fall weather here in southern Oklahoma. Uh, the mornings, uh, the wind is almost absolutely still. The temperature is down high 50s, low 60s, some mornings the low 70s. Just, you know, the skies are crystal blue. I mean, it's just, it's really, really beautiful. So hope you're enjoying the weekend. Now, look, I know we have an awful lot of viewers out on the East Coast, and our prayers are with you with all that you're going through with the horrendous rains, the flooding, the hurricane, and what have you. And uh, yeah, my earplug came out. I'm still struggling with trying to get used to my hearing aid. Horrible getting old here. But every once in a while when I'm talking, it goes, plink. <laughs> and it's just kind of flopping around out there. So anyway, uh, just want you to know that if you're on the East Coast, if you're able to watch this in any way whatsoever, uh, and we hope you are, I know that power has been out. I know that cell phone service has been out. Uh, some people have been able to even, oddly enough, have been able to get on Facebook, but they don't have cell phone service. They don't, te don't have telephone service. Don't, have, don't even have electricity, uh, regular electricity, uh, just enough to be able to get on the internet and get on Facebook. Well, we're glad you're safe. Be safe. And our prayers continue to be with you. I, uh, I contacted a really dear friend of mine who lives in South Carolina, and uh, his name's Theo Jenkins. And hey, Theo, anyway, uh, he said they had had tons and tons of rain. They had trees down, lines down, but everybody was okay. And that's what is important. You know, you can replace things. You can replace stuff. Can't replace people. And so we're really, really pleased to know that so many of our friends are okay. All right. Well, let's get into it. I want to get right back into our study of the feast days of Israel. What I've been sharing with you is the meaning of the Feast of Harvest, otherwise known as Sukkot. We've been going over the, all of the feast days of Israel. We have come to the last and it, or if you want to be technical and say, no, that's the next to the last. Well, technically speaking, Shemini Atzerat is the very last day of the festival calendar and what have you. The, the point being here, all right, in the table of contents, I list the following meanings, significances, if you want to use that term, that historically the Jews applied to the various feast days, but specifically the Feast of Sukkot, otherwise known as the Feast of Ingathering, the Feast of Harvest, all right? And it's got a lot of different names. It's got, it, is, it is called the Feast of Our Joy. It is called the Joy of the Nations, etc., etc. We'll get into that, all right? But in the table of contents, I give the following meanings, and then in the book itself, I expound on these meanings, from scholarship, both rabbinic and non-rabbinic. Well, we've already looked at Sukkot as it carried with it the idea of restoration. Sukkot and covenant renewal. Now we're going to look today at Sukkot being known as the joy of the nations, or as it was sometimes called, the salvation for the nations. This is one of the most, really, honestly, it, it's really one of the most important aspects of Sukkot. There's no question about it. You know, some people try to tell us, well, salvation was strictly and solely to Israel. They call it the Israel-only doctrine. Uh, it's false. It's ungodly. It is hopeless. It's atheistic. They deny it's atheistic, but guess what? It is. The Proverbs writer said in Proverbs 14, verse 1, the fool has said in his heart, 
no God. And the meaning of the way that it's expressed is, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God for me. In other words, God doesn't mean anything for me. It's not that they don't necessarily believe, believe that there is no God, purely no God. It's just that there is no God for me. That's precisely what these people believe who say that salvation was strictly for Israel. They are saying, no God for me. Well, guess what? That's the biblical definition of a fool. Sorry to be so blunt. That's just the way it is. So anyway, Sukkot was known and called the joy of the nations. Now, according to Numbers chapter 18 and Leviticus chapter 23, in the seven-day feast of Sukkot, every day there, was, there were more and more sacrifices to be offered until a grand total of 70 bulls were offered as sacrifice. The symbolism of 70 is a multiplication of perfect numbers. Seven is perfect. Ten is perfect in the Hebraic way of thinking. So many scholars, my, the late Michael Heiser believed and, and taught, you can find his uh, blogs still in, on, in, on the internet. But Michael Heiser said, those 70 sacrifices in the view of the Jews was the symbolic number of any and all of the nations outside of Israel. You see, during Sukkot and during the other feast days, obviously, particularly Yom Kippur, sacrifices were made strictly for Israel. No one else, strictly for Israel. But on Sukkot, the Feast of Harvest, they offered 70 bulls as sacrifice that 70 representing symbolically any and all nations other than Israel. You really, really have to catch the power of that. So here, while God made his covenant with Israel, he commanded that sacrifice be offered for all of the pagan nations and for their Benefit. Matter of fact, let me read to you one of the quotes that I have in, oops, in my book on Resurrection Feast Fulfilled, a study of the connection between Israel's final feast day and Sukkot and the resurrection. On page 32, I, get, I have the following quote from the Encyclopedia Judaica. You can look it up for yourself. I have it footnoted in the book. And it reads, quote, on the Feast of Tabernacles, it is said in a Haggadah, 78 sacrifices were offered, one for each nation. And then it was said, woe to the nations, says Rabbi Yohanan. Why? Well, because the temple was destroyed. The sacrifices ended. So Rabbi Yohanan said, Woe to the nations. He wasn't, wasn't talking about strictly Israel here. Woe to the nations. They had suffered a great loss without realizing what they had lost. You know, I'm pretty sure the Jews understood what they had lost. While the temple existed, the altar and the sacrifices atoned for them. But now, who will atone for them? And again, that's in the Encyclopedia Judaica. So in the Jewish way of thinking, the Feast of Sukkot offered sacrifices, 70 sacrifices to symbolize all of the nations of the earth, whether they knew all of them or not. Now, some scholars say that it goes back to Genesis chapter 5 and following, and the 70 nations that sprang from Adam and then Noah and what have you. That's possible. But it's also distinctly possible that this perfect number of 70 is being used 
to symbolize any and all nations, even if they did not know who they were. The point being, as this Haggadah says, the nations did not realize what they had lost when Jerusalem was destroyed. Now, let me reiterate this. I'm real sure that the Jews understood what they had lost when the temple was destroyed. But this Haggadah is talking about the 70 symbolic nations for all of the nations who did not understand that sacrifices during Sukkot were offered for their atonement. I'm sorry, folks. This utterly destroys this abominable doctrine known as Israel only. There were not 70 nations of Israel. You got that? But sacrifice was offered for 70 nations. Nations even unknown to Israel. Others, nations known to them, but who were not of Israel. You know, Josephus records how the Jews offered sacrifice for the Roman emperors. And it was during the beginning of the rebellion that some of the zealots absolutely demanded and coerced the priest into not offering sacrifice for the Caesars. Some of the more moderate forces within the city appealed to them and said, listen, we've been offering sacrifice to the Caesars since the days of Augustus. And the Roman Empire has granted us peace, has granted us liberty to worship in the way that we want. If you, if you cease these sacrifices for Rome, Rome was not Israel, then surely they will see that as an act of war and they will bring the full might of their power and their armies down on us. Well, the zealots wouldn't listen so they withdrew the sacrifices. But do you catch what Josephus was reporting there? From the days of Augustus Caesar, the second Roman em emperor, from the days of Augustus, they had been offering sacrifice for the Roman emperors. And let me reiterate this point, ladies and gentlemen, not trying to be redundant, but you absolutely must catch the power of it. The Romans were not the Israelites. They were pagan idolaters, unrelated to Israel and the ten tribes. Now, does that mean that there weren't some scattered Israelites in, in the Roman Empire? No, it didn't say that, didn't apply that. I'm simply saying that the Romans were not the 10 northern tribes. And anyone who would try to convince you of that is not being honest with reality and with history. It is a perversion of history. So, this is the significance of the Feast of Sukkot. Now, it's really, really interesting and significant that in Zechariah chapter 14, and you see this, this emphasizes that Sukkot was intended to be the joy of the nations. In Zechariah chapter 14, 1 to 5, we have a prediction of a yet future time of judgment on Jerusalem at the day of the Lord and his coming with all of his saints, which, by the way, Paul quoted from in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13. So Paul was looking for the coming of the Lord to fulfill Zechariah 14 in his generation. The coming of the Lord in Zechariah 14 was to be the coming of the Lord against Jerusalem. It had nothing to do with an end of time 
or nothing to do with the end of the Christian age. Listen, today, as I filmed this, I was reading a post by one of these Israel-only individuals, and they were attacking me, and they said, well, Preston says that uh, the Christian age has no end. This shows you how wrong Preston is because 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says, then comes the end. You know, I really couldn't believe how dishonest, and I know this individual, and this is pure dishonesty. He was claiming that Paul was predicting and speaking about the end of the Christian age. Well, point number one, the Bible teaches emphatically the current Christian age has no end. But Israel only people turn it into the Christian age will come to an end. That's how dishonest they are. Furthermore, the end in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 would be the end of the law that was the strength of the sin. 1 Corinthians 15, 55 and 56. Well, guess what? That's not the Christian age. The gospel is not the law that was the strength of sin. The only law that was the strength of sin was the old covenant law. Therefore, the end, which would arrive at the end of the law, that was the strength of the sin, would be the old covenant age, the end of the law of Moses. But that's how perverse these Israel-only people are. And I'm sorry to speak so bluntly, folks. Those of you who follow my channel, you know I don't normally speak this bluntly. But let me say this. I have yet to encounter. Now, look, I know there's got to be some honest, I think deluded, I think deceived people within that movement, if you even want to call it a movement. Every single spokesman, every single outspoken spokesman that, of the Israel-only movement that I have encountered was blatantly, flagrantly, willfully dishonest, every single one of them. I don't make any exceptions. Now, I've encountered one that I haven't, I haven't caught him in as many dishonesties, so I give him the benefit of the doubt. But the argumentation used by Israel-only folks is dishonest to the core. So the point being here that Zechariah 14 predicts the time of the end. It predicts the coming of the Lord. But what, what kind of a coming of the Lord is? Is it? It's the judgment of Israel. It's not the end of planet Earth. It's not the end of the Christian age. It's the end of the old covenant age represented by Jerusalem and the temple. At this day of the Lord and his coming with all of his saints, what do we find? Well, let's see here. Verse 8. And it shall be in the in that day that living water shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them to, toward the former sea, half of them toward the hinder sea, and summer and winter shall it be. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day there shall be one Lord, and his name one. Now look, folks, this is echoed directly in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 28. That at the day of the resurrection, you know, the day of the end of the law, that was the strength of sin, the Lord shall be one. Well, guess what? That's Zechariah 14 and the day of the Lord against Jerusalem when in that day, the day of the Lord against Jerusalem, the Lord shall be one. That means that 1 Corinthians 15, and unless it's talking about a different day of the Lord in which the Lord would be one all in all, that means 1 Corinthians 15 has got to be posited at the time of the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70, but I've got to hurry on. Okay, notice now that, and I, I just got to skip way down. It should come to pass, verse 16, that everyone that, el, that is left of all of the nations which came against Jerusalem, that's not Israel. Israel didn't come against Jerusalem. All of the nations that came against Jerusalem shall go up year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep 
the Feast of Tabernacles. Day of the Lord, at the judgment of Jerusalem, the destruction of the enemies of God, that's 1 Corinthians 15, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies until I make your enemies your footstool. Psalms 110, quoted in 1 Corinthians 15, 22 and following. And it's the time in which the Lord shall be one, in which the Gentiles would be brought to Jerusalem to worship the Lord. Not Israel only, all of the nations that had fought against Jerusalem. Let me reiterate, that's not Israel. Shall come to Jerusalem and keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, tomorrow, we're going to ask the question and try to answer it. Does this mean that after the, the day of the Lord in the new Jerusalem, thus in the new heaven and earth, that the literal, physical Feast of Tabernacle will be, will be observed by pagan nations? No, it doesn't, right? Uh, Go to my website and order, you know, you've only got a couple of days left. May, may not have any left after all. Uh, two book special, okay, September 2024, U.S. orders only, resurrection feast fulfilled, and I will include free of charge, can God tell time. Total delivered price, $20. Your time is almost up, if it's not already. Since I'm mentioning this on Monday, I will honor it. Orders sit in today. Okay, thank you for joining me. I appreciate you being with me. I'll see you on the flip side.